Senator Kel Seliger, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me. Very happy. I want to start by just asking you something very basic. How did you get started in politics? Tell us a little about how and why. It was that eighth grade student council race at Stephen F. Austin Junior High School in Borger. Not really. I, it's, <laughs> um, it, it has been sort of a, a lifelong interest because my, my parents were always very interested in, in the state of government, the effect of government on a, a family, been an immigrant family and a small business. And, and I really was in student council when I was in school. And then my wife and I were active at home, the 1988 Randall County Bush Quail co-chairman. And uh, in 1989, a friend of mine who served on the Amarillo City Council, we called it commission, called me and said he wasn't gonna run again and thought I ought to run, that I'd expressed an interest not to run. So I ran in 1989. And um, ran again in 91, and in 93, I had filed for re-election, and the mayor called me on a Sunday night and said that he was not going to run again. He'd served for two terms. He thought I ought to run, and he was going to endorse me the next day on Tuesday if I would run. It was a very generous and gracious thing to do, particularly when, since I wasn't sure he liked me. And so uh, I ran for mayor and, and uh, was elected four terms mayor of, of Amarillo. And um, then I left office in 2001, and um, was appointed to the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission. In two, late 2003, uh, the late Teal Bivens was the senator, held this office, and then President Bush was going to nominate him to be the ambassador to Sweden. And that's when I decided to run for the Texas Senate. I was in a race with six other people and, and set what the Secretary of State at the time told me was a record three elections in 48 days and was elected in 2004 and 2008. But what, what was the predicate for all this, which I think is particularly important, was just as a community volunteer, Budget Committee of the United Way, which everybody can do. I was one of, if not the first male, to head a sexual assault awareness group in the United States. And, and it is still, the Amarillo uh, uh, Rape Crisis Domestic Violence Center is still one of the models around the country, which I think is a very important thing. And, um, and that's it, it started with civic involvement. I happen to be one of those people who think that municipal government or local government, school boards and county commissions and city councils are the best place because you, you learn what, uh, what public service is really, really about. Because after that, concerns of people, they're all potholes of one size or extent or another. They get deep and they get broad, but they're really the, the things that concern citizens who elect people like me to serve them. Um, I'm also one of the primary reasons that there was a proposal in I think the 81st legislature to uh, statutorily limit the number of local officials that could be elected to the legislature. We're kind of a problem. And, uh, <laughs> And, and, and that is as it should be. <laughs> you might have been ahead of your time in thinking that. <laughs> Maybe. Or, um, how, how was the jump from, from doing these, these other, you know, more locally based offices to the Senate? Well, when you had a go? The, the, the pol it's, it's more policy than, than just pure procedure and, and function. Um, it's one thing to provide a, a municipal supply of water for a community of, of 100,000 people. It's another thing altogether to deal with the policies by which water will be provided to an entire state, rural and urban issues over the next 40, 50, 100 years. And so it, the, the policy sort of things are deeper, but the public service element is not. We still get phone calls from people like I did at City Hall and Borger that say, I've got a problem, can you help with this problem? And we go do that because we represent them and are, are there to serve their needs. I want to talk about a big pothole, and we might as well start with that, uh -huh. since people are wondering. Let's talk a little bit about redistricting, and you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the background, um, but can you give us the, the latest? You know, what, have, what have you heard in terms of the, the, the state's request for a stay on the maps uh, that were drawn in the legislature, et, et cetera? At this point, the, stay has, the, the, the state has requested an emergency stay of the implementation of the interim maps. In the case of the, the Texas Senate, we got most of what we wanted in the objections that we filed. Originally, in that interim map, there were adjustments to 27 districts. There are now adjustments to five. At the same time, that area in which the court made adjustments in that interim map we feel are not required by the law 
and and it should be appealed. And so that stay request will go to uh, Justice Scalia, who sits over the Fifth Circuit, and from there to the Supreme Court if necessary. There will be an appeal in any case. It's a question. The stay essentially stops the implementation of the interim maps pending the, the appeal. And the appeal is over, do we, do we do the maps that we pass and the governor sign or we didn't? That's where we are right now. The, the, the most pressing implication is, is if a stay is granted, it will probably delay the primaries, at least for the legislature, probably until May. The presidential primary will go on in March. If the stay is not granted, the appeal goes forward. Uh, the maps will be implemented that came out of the court and we'll hold elections under those maps and then once the appeal is dealt with, if, if the state prevails in the appeal, then we'll go back and probably in two years we will have elections under the maps that we passed in 2011. Do you think, it, do you think it's worth it to delay the elections till May? If that was to be the outcome, would not is the trade-off worth it? It would not necessarily be my preference, but it is the process, and it's worthwhile. I, I happen to think that adjustments made to the congressional map are, are uh, sort of egregious examples of judicial activism. And in, in the court saw things that they liked better, but were they violations of Section 2 of the Voter Rights Act? No, they weren't. In, in my estimation, and I was careful in developing that estimation. I am not a lawyer. And I wasn't here the last time redistricting was done. And so the procedure that we followed was instead of hiring minority and majority counsel for our committee, we went and hired people who would just simply call balls and strikes. An adjunct professor at Texas Law School by the name of Robert Heath, who's probably as experienced a litigator in such issues as there is in the country, and a couple of professors at Baylor University Law School who don't draw maps themselves. All they do is determine whether the law is being violated or not. And my procedure was very simple. Every time that we put an idea on paper or on a map, the question was very clear, is this a violation of law? And if they said, yes it is, or we believe it is, we didn't do it. And, and so nowhere in here did we rely, rely upon my legal judgment, of which there is none, um, but the most expert judgment. And that's why I'm fairly confident when I talk about judicial overreach. So, so what do you think, so you think the, what was motivating the judges then in, in, I mean, in other words, do you think that reasonable people can disagree about the issues that, that are at stake in the maps? I, yes, I, I think there's reasonable disagreement. Um, not everything in, in law is absolutely clear. There's a matter of interpretation and, and, and people view precedent in different ways. Uh, at the same time, I think there's an almost irresistible sort of, of uh, uh, inclination to overreach and participate where you have the opportunity to participate. What a great opportunity for, for a judge to participate in the legislative process. We see the governor do it in things like the Gardasil issue. There was just pure legislation by the executive branch. And, and, and I understand that inclination. That's why we have courts to which we can appeal that sort of thing. Do you think the legislature is subject to the same overreaching tendency when it comes to the partisan dynamics and drawing the maps? Not so much in the partisan dynamics, but when we talk about the pure composition, do we get to go in and interpret laws and impose that interpretation on someone else? We never do. do does the legislature get to do things like issue executive orders that are simply done by fiat and not through the process? No, we really don't. We don't get to do that sort of thing, which is fine. Separation of powers to me is fundamental to our form of government. I think it should be strictly observed. How do, you, how do you think the public perceives this? Or when you, when you go, you, we talked beforehand about you've been in a lot of town hall meetings. This is the season for that. Uh, does redistricting come up in the town hall meetings? And when you try to explain redistricting to the constituents, how do you sort that out? I mean, as this, you, know, you get in the weeds pretty quickly, I think. And so I wonder how you, how you do that. Um, no, but you generally find this, that, that in issues that are governmental issues that are of interest to the public, they don't necessarily want to dig a lot deeper in large numbers than, than the news and analysis that they see. They're interested. From a person who represents a district in West Texas, I explained a few things and basically told them what was going to happen. Um, there weren't that many changes in the district that I represent. Um, 
going forward, if this map is implemented, I will not represent one county of the 26 that I've represented in the past, and I'll represent about uh, 11 or 12 new ones. So it's just a question of going by and saying, I represent you now, and I'm proud to do so. And, and if somebody has a question, we talk about it. Um, there's been a certain amount of second guessing. You're talking about separation of powers and different roles in this. Mm -hmm. And of course, you, we, everybody has the, the, the benefit of hindsight, perhaps, right now. Do you think bypassing the Justice Department was a good idea? Um, yeah, and here was the calculation. It, it, it is not bypassing in some sort of sense that, that there's a deception or there's kind of a shifty move. The law offers one a, a two-pronged approach when it comes to preclearance under Section 5. And that is to go to the Justice Department for preclearance or... And, and this kind of shortens the process, go direct to the three-judge panel, and if they don't grant preclearance, it, it immediately is appealed to the Supreme Court. So it is a somewhat um, truncated sort of process, a little bit more efficient in our view. I think that the calculation of some people was, we've got a map that's gonna be drawn largely by Republicans in Texas, instead of going to the, uh, the Obama Justice Department, Let's go right to the court system. And I understand that calculation. Uh, one of the things that we found out on the, on the Texas Senate map was that the Justice Department, Obama's or anybody else's, did not find any violations of Section 5 in that map. And, and the only reason that's still in there is because of action of interveners. Um, they would have granted preclearance on that right on the spot. So, so there, was, there was some complexity in that. Yeah. I mean... There seems to be complexity in everything in redistricting. Yeah, if, you read, if you read the decision, it's, um, I think that becomes pretty manifest. Right. That there's a lot of gray areas in terms of you know, any number of areas in the law. Um, you know, with, so I mean, I, I guess the overall question, with benefit of hindsight, any regrets? Yeah, there's some things that I would have done differently. Uh, we were working on the maps, and this is particularly true with the Texas Senate map. Uh, we didn't do anything with the house map. That's the work of our colleagues across the rotunda, and we didn't mess with it. Uh, we just passed what they sent us. On the Senate map, yeah, I would have done a couple of things a little differently. I would have rolled the map out more than 24 or 30 hours before we took it to, uh, to committee so people could have looked at it. It wouldn't have changed anything. But I got caught in a, in a press for time with all the other business that we were doing. And keep in mind, we were waiting toward the end of the session to try and, and get the budget largely done so we didn't get two big, big items mixed up with, with one another. The last thing in the world that, that we wanted was having somebody come along and say, I'll vote for this budget, though I hate it, if you'll do this and this with the district. Didn't want to do that. Thought that was, of all the right. things you could do wrong, that would be the worst. And so we got a little, we got pressed for time there. And I would have spent, I think, a little bit more time with individual members, even though I was available all the time to every member of the Senate to talk about districts. Yeah, that, that, that turned out to be a fairly hectic time as you were trying to put it. Was it was tremendously hectic, and I wish I'd have made a little more time. I could have delayed the, the committee hearing by a day or so. At the same time, because it is always controversial, and there are always elements of partisanship in it, the people who weren't happy weren't going to be happy anyway. But I could have, that, that would have been the easiest objection to address, and, and I, wished I'd, I wish I had addressed that. There's some technical things in the map. I could have done this a little differently or that a little differently. Um, but uh, by and large, I think it's a good product, and I think it's a legal product. Um, and, uh, it, and once again, in the Texas Senate map, at a couple of junctures, at several junctures, and maybe final passage, that vote was 29 to 2. With 19 Republicans, it, mean a lot, it means a lot of Democrats voted for it and felt like it was, a, it was a fair map, which says a lot about redistricting, because I'm not sure that we have seen that in, uh, in a long, long time. I want to move on a little bit, although I, I suspect we'll come back to that in Q&A. Um, you're also on the, you know, be, because apparently you're a magnet for controversial things, you're also on the, on the, on the Joint uh, Oversight Committee for Higher Education. Uh, which met a couple weeks ago. How's that going? I think it's going well. And there will be no legislation, I don't think, coming out of that. 
But it's it's important with all the things that were said and and the things that came out of the seven breakthrough solutions and and the appointment of of an individual who the general public thought was 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 there to provide some sort of oversight or supervisory function at the university to take a look and see just just what's going on about this discussion of efficiency and economy when it comes to higher education. All functions of government for which people are being taxed should be scrutinized, I think, consistently for things like efficiency and economy. Basically, we're spending the public's money to do so. But you have to start with another assumption. Higher education is by its very nature inefficient, certainly in a corporate model. Can, can you have anything on a balance sheet that, that shows the benefit of Eastern religions or philosophy or things like that? And the answer is no. At the same time, society greatly benefits from an educated population, people that have been exposed to, to schools of thought and, and academic disciplines. There's a huge benefit. The problem is, is it's largely an intangible one. And, and we were talking about largely tangible things when we talk about the seven breakthrough solutions. But should we ask those questions? Absolutely. If, and in, in this statement was made, if 20% of your faculty is teaching 80% of your courses, is there a problem? Is there a disconnect there? Are we getting the most out of the resources there? Perfectly good question. And there will be answers there going forward. But, but our oversight committee, I think, was designed to make sure that we discuss all of the elements, not just the ones that were there in what looked like a corporate model for higher education. So do you think that it was the political discussion that made it necessary to move that out of the existing committees? Uh, quite likely. That and, and, and the desire to do it jointly with our colleagues in the House. And, and so, yeah, I think it was the appropriate way to do it. Um, what, what do you think? I mean, I, I think you've, you've alluded to some of this, but you know, in terms of your thoughts about higher ed, and you, you're a father with a couple of sons engaged, that have been engaged in the process, um, you know, what is important to you that you, you know, when you sit in that committee and you think about what's important to you in higher education and what you would like to accomplish, what comes to mind? Um, you know, for the sake of full disclosure, that, that I have one son who's a graduate of this department recently and, and one who's a junior at the University of Texas, it does, does the educational process allow one to grow, both in industrial terms, in terms of preparation for, for some sort of vocational endeavor, but do they grow intellectually in their ability to critically process information? One of the most important things I think that, that people can learn is that there are a lot of, of different schools of thought and thought processes, and they are all valid because they motivate different people to think things and do things, and that we should be open-minded and we should be exposed to all of the things that influence thought, action, philosophy, and, and things like that. Um, I look at, at my own children who were sort of the laboratory for my... Um, legislation having to do with high stakes testing and things like that. Do I think that they came out of the university as, as bigger people, more broad-minded people, people who were inquisitive, people who knew how to read, not just, not just grammar, but how to read, what, what books, not just what do they say, but what do they mean? Yeah, I think they did. Um, is there a dollar and cents value in all that? No. Do you think there's a sense that there's a there's support for that kind of thinking about higher education more broadly in the state? You underscore the issue with more broadly. People in the state of Texas simply want to feel like they've got value for their money, and and I think they view it in a very elemental sense. Um, is, is is are we turning out people who are going to make our economy grow? Who are going to make Texas better? I think we confuse that sometimes by, by trying to put a, a strict balance sheet on it. And I, I think that's the questions. I think people are tremendously uh, and, and somewhat indiscriminately influenced by the image of waste. And they don't care whether it's academic, 
They don't care whether it's in Parks and Wildlife or Department of Public Safety or University System. They object to waste. But we need to define what waste and inefficiency are. And that's what the, what the discussion is about now. So you think the committee, I, I had a, a guest previously this semester, suggests that one of the functions of the Oversight Committee is going to be to sort of, I, think, I, I actually asked him if he thought, I thought he was tamping down the political conflict, and he said he thought it was sort of airing it out a little bit. That makes sense to you? Absolutely. We need to air it out. They're, they are legitimate questions. They need to be asked, asked from all perspectives. Another topic, you've been um, an advocate for the statewide water plan. Uh, and we were talking rec recently about how uh, really, you know, before water was cool in a way, you know, in other words, before the drought hit, right. and it was really on the agenda. Talk a little bit about, about what you've done for that and what you think. I was talking to some people recently, and I said, you haven't heard anybody in the state of Texas say anything good about the drought. Now is your big opportunity, because I'm going to. I think that, that this drought, because of its depth and extent, have attra has attracted people's attention to what potential situations of water deficit mean. In a committee hearing a couple of weeks ago, the mayor of Grossbeck was in our committee and at one point in tears, here's a town that this is not a wide spot in the road. There's a, there's a, a small town with a population of 4,000 people, a school district of 1,600 kids that, that was looking at running out of water by Thanksgiving just passed. What was going to be done and how was it going to be paid for with a small budget? And pipelines cost a lot of money. The closest water in terms of new source was about eight miles away. That's all, and, and that's got to be a half million dollars in pipeline right there in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a pretty simple sort of arrangement. But at the same time, planning is probably no more important than any other area than it is water. Because if you look at the impoundments, reservoirs, that areas like uh, the Metroplex are going to need in the future, that planning, in, planning not just in terms of, of the technical details, but the fiscal details, we need to start now because if they, if they fired up the first tractor tomorrow, it'll be 30 years before they get any water out of there. Can you imagine what the population of the Metroplex is going to be 30 years from now? And what it will mean if the water is not available by one means or another? Well, one of the answers is, is in the urban areas, who will have all the political power in the future, they will look to places like West Texas and the Texas Panhandle and say, well, let's just go get their water. And there won't be the political will otherwise or ability to, to sort of stop that sort of thing. And so the Water Infrastructure Fund to me is absolutely a critical feature of, of legislative attention every year. Six billion dollars in bonds issued this time, Proposition 2, I think were important, but we need to fund it. And we're talking about 50 billion dollars over the next 30 years. We need to put money in it every time as an absolute priority. Realizing that the issues are, have a lot of facets to them, because keep in mind, a lot of people get their water from the ground, groundwater, uh, surface water, lakes and reservoirs, rivers and things like that. And there are details that go in there. You've got the Ogallala Aquifer up in the Texas Panhandle that does not recharge. Whatever water is there is all that's ever going to be there. At the same time, the Edwards Aquifer is almost infinitely rechargeable. But there are going to be problems here, too, because the population in this area is going to grow and pressure on the Edwards Aquifer, multiply the population here two or three times, and, and take San Antonio and things like that, all the people who use the Edwards Aquifer, it's going to be exactly the same problem. It may recharge, but it won't recharge enough to meet the needs of a growing population. It seems like water, along with transportation, maybe one or two other issues, are so fundamentally long-term in, in their nature. How do you, how do you hold people, I mean, aside from a drought, and it was nice of you to say something nice about the yeah, drought. Nice. Aside from the drought, how do you get people to, how do you seize people's attention in the legislature? What's, is there a trick to that? It's hard to do because planning is made in two-year cycles along election windows, and we're talking about a transportation plan that's got to go years and years and years in order to accommodate the traffic requirements along I-35 over the next 20, 30 years when you realize that you're looking at growth all the way from the Red River to, to Houston and then take the valley. It's going to take a tremendous amount of planning and money at the same time. The transportation needs of everybody in Texas are exactly the same, whether you live in Fort Davis or you live in Fort Worth. And so how do we balance that ledger? Because mile for mile, it's going to cost a lot more for a mile along I-35 
than it does on a farm to market road or a state highway in West Texas. But you've got to get the people in West Texas to buy into the overall plan because you can't, there's probably no other area where you can so profoundly demonstrate that people in some parts of the state are going to pay for all the infrastructure for other people. That's also true when you look at the potential tax plans for things like that and say, well, let's just index the gas tax. Per capita, people in West Texas will pay more because they probably drive more to get to school and get to work and get to the hospital and things like that. And so it, it's not just as simple as we've got a growing population, let's add on to I-35. You can't discuss that without talking about adding on to Farm to Market Road 1992 or maintaining it. Do you think the political, the current political climate makes it even harder to engage those? It strikes me that both in terms of the growing skepticism of elected officials and the growing concern over the size, and, and really not even so much size, but effectiveness of government. Is it making it harder to engage all that? It makes it difficult because there are people who would be, who would be perfectly happy if, if we didn't provide an awful lot of the services that the state provides. Uh, we've seen instances where people in, in the legislature have, have, when we talk about public health, who are perfectly willing, in, in my view, to let some poor people die for political reasons. And that sounds kind of harsh, but it's true. And I said it in committee, so why not say it here? Um, and there's this, what, what overshadows all of that is the distrust of government. And um, unfortunately, we in the legislature get painted with the same brush as, as the folks in Congress, for which there's not only a, an abiding distrust, but I think an absolute malevolence on the part of the public, and not undeserved. Um, and so we get painted with the same brush and you just have to live with it and, and do what you can. But yeah, the mistrust of, of government and government spending and, and things like that make things very, very difficult. Um, with a growing population, can we live with current tax levies in the state of Texas? Well, it, it's a good question, particularly when you've got a formula-driven system like public education. You've got the public education cohort growing by 60, 70,000 students a year, and it's driven by formula. It automatically drives a certain amount of money. And we're going to have that discussion, and we're going to have it vigorously. John Stossel, in a, in a thing he did on TV about three years ago, said correctly that the key to public education, don't just stand back and throw money at it but to assume also that it is, will require no new money and things like that are not entirely correct. And so we said about this the right way, I think, in the 82nd legislature. Reduce spending by $15 billion and look very hard at efficiencies and did what, what hadn't been done in a long time. Sat down with public school people and university people and say, what sort of mandate are you operating under that increase your costs that you could do without, that we could blow up? And there's, there's simple things very often. Sometimes they're not so simple. A full-time equivalent, a full-time employee at West Texas A&M in Canyon that does nothing but keeps mileage on university-operated vehicles. And I feel certain that they can probably keep that pickup out of the parking lot at Whataburger, so what? And, and we have to look at things like that and how can we help. I think it's one of the few times I've seen where the government sort of systematically looked at what, what expensive mandates were and unfunded mandates really were. And I think that's a great thing to do. You know, that kind of leads where I wanted to. You mentioned um, in, in reading some clips and getting ready for this. At one point, I think you, you referred, I think it was in the Amarillo paper, you mentioned that the last session was the most difficult, you know, it was in some ways the most difficult you had seen. Um, yeah. Going to get any better? I mean, you, you seem to sort of be comfortable with what happened with education, or at least to think that that was an interesting process, but it's obviously not over. Um, will the next session be easier? What, what, will the, what will the other shoe dropping on this look like? Next session will not be easier because we're going to be, you take the current base bill going forward with, with the population growth and whatever the other shortfalls in, in tax levies are, and we're still going to have a structural deficit. We, may, we may not be wringing our hands saying we've got a $27 billion deficit this time next year, but most certainly it will be a $10 billion deficit. We've done the tricks and the adjustments, some of which we can repeat, some of which were sort of one-time things. We can go collect some taxes earlier. We can do some deferrals. But at the same time, we still, the, the people of Texas 
demand a certain level of, of service and, and in areas where only the state can provide it. So we're going to be under the gun. Uh, one of the things that's going to be tougher is when we talk about public education. And we talk about a formula that was implemented, I believe, in 93 and it now has pretty well broken down. And we're going to have to go back and look at formulas and how we fund it. Look at the overall tax structure and how are we going to fund adequately from the state or from, from tax provided funding. When you have some students in the state of Texas at 12,000 and some at 4,800 and less, there's a clear disconnect. We have to be very, very careful that we don't have a system that says by its very structure that we value the education and the future of some kids more than others. No, anybody, anybody would be loath to say that, but if that's the way your system works, th that is a clear message that something has got to be done and it's going to be, um, it's going to be pretty sweeping. We looked at some radical stuff this time, doing away with the target revenue system, which was an absolute train wreck from, from start to finish, where the state systematically picked winners and losers when it came to school funding. Nobody, even the winners, said it was fair. And yet, and yet getting it done away with is tremendously difficult. You know, I noticed two things in, in that answer. Um, one, the way you seem to, you know, very comfortable with the term structural deficit, mm -hmm. which some people would really deny, actually. Not a lot, but some, and I think many people that, that denied that held a lot of sway in the last session. And, and, and then the fact that people recognize the problem of, in, the problems of inequality in public education funding. Those were very tough discussions in that last legislature. Now, you know, we don't know who's going to be in the next legislature. We're not even sure what maps are going to be. But um, is, you know, I mean, are you, do you have any kind of optimism? I, I sense a certain underlying kind of faith in the ability of the legislature to engage this. Public discourse has changed with the, with the Internet and, and communications where almost anyone can hold sway, anybody with an idea or, or a bankroll. And, and what that has done to transparency in government, I think, is very good. Yeah, I'm always optimistic. I'm, I'm optimistic because of the elasticity of our economy. Uh, I'm particularly, we have four more to be optimistic about in the state of Texas because I think we have an, a fundamental economy that's far more resilient and has more potential for growth in pure economic terms. When we talk about a, a structural deficit, we need to be very clear, and in, in, in in, this is my simple view, which is pretty much is most of my views, and that is when we take the base budget, the budget we are working on today simply rolls forward as the base budget in the next biennium. You add to that inflation, which is immutably present, things like population growth, uh, variations in expected tax levy, levy, that's where you get a structural deficit. Now you can call it a pr prospective deficit, you can call it a projected shortfall, I don't care. The problems are not grammatical ones, they're fiscal ones. And, um, I, but yeah, I, I'm always optimistic, always. Um, I wanna open it up for questions in a minute, but I do wanna, I wanna ask one more. I, you know, I can't not ask a question about bear, that means poli it's always about bear politics, right? <laughs> um, uh. You know, and, and you know, you and I talked about this and we'll ask, I'll ask the, uh, the, the opposite question on, on Thursday of my next guest, but, <laughs> but what's going on in the Republican Party right now? Um, it seems that, I mean, in part, victims of, of their own success in a certain way, sure. I mean, which is bound to happen. But some of the toughest fights and some of the, the kind of meanest politics we've seen in the last few years, it seems to me, have been inside the Republican Party rather than between Republicans and Democrats. Is that gonna, is that gonna uh, get a little less intense, you think? You expect no. it to get better before it gets worse, or no? I expect it to get worse before it gets better. Um, I, I said this years ago, that in the Republican Party, we, we looked at the situation where it was 130 years between, between Republican majorities, and that we were acting like that we were really taking turns and that we were, at the time that I said it, we were six or seven years into our 130 years, and we had a long time to go before we have to turn over the reins. Clearly that's not true. Um, we, we, there, there is a, appears to be, and I'm quoting 
somebody, there's a fight for the heart and soul of the Republican Party, where now it, the, the priority in a lot of people's mind is who are the really pure Republicans, the true conservatives, and anyone who is not, based upon criteria that I, is set by I'm not sure who, is then, uh, a, is then a heretic. And that there will be a Republican orthodoxy in doctrine. And if, if this Republican does not adhere to it, that is less of a Republican. I think if anything kind of, uh, I don't have a lot of problems with that because I've always been a fiscal conservative. Do I, do I measure up? We got away from, this is an important concept. You remember the idea of the compassionate conservative? He died, in, you know. <laughs> And what we have now is the callous conservative. We need to get away with that because government can do, can do good things for people. Uh, but I think if there's anything that I find particularly interesting is people keep invoking um, Ronald Reagan, as they should, as, as sort of, of the guiding spirit of the Republican Party. And then those same people in the next, in, in, we'll forget the 11th commandment, which was, thou shalt not speak ill of another Republican, and then attempt to eviscerate another Republican office holder or candidate in the media, instead of letting our friends in the Democratic Party do it, with which they are very capable. And, and that's what concerns me the most, because we're gonna see a time when there are gonna be Republicans that other Republicans will not support. And, um, you won't see that as much in, in primaries necessarily because everybody knows if you don't vote in a Republican primary, but in general elections, I think that you're going to see a lot of Democrats elected by Republicans who simply feel that the, the Republican Party has become just that, callous conservatives instead of compassionate conservatives. And, um, you know, that gets a little bit abstract, but it sort of concerned me, who's never been anything but a Republican. There was no... There was nothing for me to go from and to. I've always been a Republican and feel like that it has always probably provided a clear and more pragmatic vision for the country, certainly as a small businessman and, and a, a local official, I feel that way. But uh, in, in very many instances, we're going to be our own worst enemy. Pogo was right. And with that, I, I could ask you tons more questions, but I want to give people an opportunity. So... Questions from the audience? We'll start with Paul, and then we'll go to Brian. Actually, we'll start with Brian. He's right. That's good. Senator, I have a, a water question. Um, at the uh, Texas Tribune Fest, there was a nice panel on, on water policy, and uh, a former executive director of the LCRA uh, attributed our water crisis, uh, current water crisis, to uh, the drought, and then he said to low prices. And as an economist, that struck me as an odd statement since it, the causality seemed to be that low prices were causing the problem. Right. And, and so if, in fact, prices are a problem, is it because the price system no longer works given the regulatory structure? And, and if so, you know, is there a way out of that in the belief that at the end of the day, prices will govern the the behavior of people when it comes to the usage of water. You are probably going to do some, some really important research on the economies of water. Water most recently has been monetized, which I think is a fascinating sort of thing. And up in the panhandle, we sort of did that uh, when the Canadian River Municipal Water Authority bought hundreds of thousands of, of water rights from Mesa Water. But as late, let's, let's go to the micro example of what you're talking about. It was as late as 1996 or 97 in the city of Amarillo, if you were a residential, commercial, or industrial user, at a certain number of thousand gallons or hundreds of thousands of gallons a month, you get a price break on the next increment of increase, which, which does not lend itself, obviously, to conservation. And so we went along and, and decided we need to do this because Pricing provides those limits. And so then we went in and said, if you're gonna use X number of additional thousand of gallons, it's gonna cost you this. Industry pushed back hard because it was, gonna, it was gonna increase cost of production, but without water, you have no production. 
And we have not in the Texas Panhandle, and we, we suffer probably more profoundly un, under the specter of running out of water in certain areas in, in an aquifer that does not recharge. We haven't had an industrial prospect yet turn us down because of future shortfalls of water. The day might come when we need to protect against that. 95% of the water used on the northern Ogala aquifer is in agriculture. Ours is an agricultural economy without ag, we really don't have an economy. How do we conserve it? Allow, we want agriculture to be profitable now and way off into the future. And so the issues regarding values and the economies of water, we're just entering that stage, but they are going to be huge. When you've got, I don't know, you remember the tremendous problems in Georgia just a few years ago in a big drought. There are probably over a half a million people in California that are in water deficit areas, 400 million in China. Well, it's gonna be a universal problem in discussion. It's, it's gonna be a huge policy debate everywhere in the world, except in East Texas where they have plenty of water. And have the irritating tendency to remind me of that whenever I'm there. <laughs> well, East Texas has to have something. They <laughs> uh, Paul, do you wanna ask a question? It's really not an event if Paul doesn't ask a question. Okay, fair. <laughs> uh, how you doing, sir? Fine. <clears throat> Thanks for coming. Um, you, you've been really refreshing today, I have to say. Uh, Thank you. One of the things that you mentioned was that you felt it was an uh, overstep of the separation of powers for the judiciary to be taking on this redistricting. You also mentioned uh, that there are uh, legitimate views from all sides. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you say to the idea of uh, this judiciary stepping in as a legitimate view of the, set of the uh, checks and balances of powers where it was perceived uh, by minority groups that the legislature did not uh, act correctly and that the judiciary is balancing that? The, ref the, the system by which this legislation is referred to the courts by whatever methods, provides that checks and balances. Clearly the court has a lot of discretion, but the court's discretion in interpreting the laws to find those areas where the law has been violated, and what we found in these maps are there are areas where there was no violation of the law, no purported violation of the law, the court simply redrew it. And, and we, we'll talk substantially about that, uh, Senator Davis is going to be here who made a great case to preserve District 10 based upon its, its existence as, as a Hispanic opportunity district, but it is not a minority majority district. It simply is not, and the district the court created is not. And so then comes the specter of how about a coalition district where a coalition of, uh, of minorities select the candidate of their choice. The problem with that is there's no such real thing as a coalition district. Specifically, when you look at, at District 10 and you talk about part of the minority population is African American, part of the, the minority population is Latino. They have under the existing maps elected an Anglo male Democrat, an Anglo male Republican, and an Anglo female Democrat. Who then is the candidate of choice and how can you determine that it was, that it was determined by a coalition or, 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 or a, a minority? They, the law makes it very clear that a minority majority district is 50% plus one. And, and, and that hasn't changed. We'll ask her about that. <laughs> Whatever gave you that idea. <laughs> That's a long answer to sort of a brief question. I can do that. Question from Since we picked on Gardner, we'll let him ask a question. I, <laughs> it's the least we can do. How are you doing? I'm fine. Um, if I understood you correctly, I think you said something like you're going to be representing, if, you're, if your counties hold, about 20% uh, of Texas counties. 37 so, counties, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there's been talk in the past about maybe uh, the Senate should have more members. Uh, you should make a leap like that. Any idea if, if there's more talk of that at all in terms of both, I guess, just the Senate and the House, maybe just focus on the Senate for now, just, just going to the Constitution, I guess. Early on in my first session, I said to somebody, we ought to expand the size of, of the Texas Senate. 
and I was new, and somebody said, well, this is his first session. Isn't he cute? And, uh, but if you look at it just in pure logistical terms, and somebody says, well, he's a rural guy, and there will be more rural terms, there will be more rural representatives, clearly not. In the, the, the percentage, the proportion of, of, the greatest proportion of representatives in the legislature is going to be urban, and that is going to be increasingly so. It becomes, as much as anything else, a logistical concern. In, in the district that I believe that, that I will be assigned or that will be the subject of this election, is going to be about 37 counties, about 50,000 square miles, substantially larger than Indiana, Connecticut, Rhode Island, a lot of those, those places. You better tune your car up. Oh, I wore one out. And, and so logistically it's tough because for somebody like me, it's important to go and talk to those people. I think it's very important for those folks to get to see the people who represent them and talk to them about their schools and law enforcement in their county. Whether or not there's a deer season in Palmer County, nobody's gonna lose any sleep over that here, but it matters to people in Texas who, who have the same aspirations and desires and things like that, anybody else. Logistically, it's very difficult, and I think it would be somewhat more efficient to increase the size. And so in, in, in my office, we're talking about going to 37, um, members in introducing a bill, it would have to be a, an amendment to the Texas Constitution to go to 37 members of, of the Texas Senate. Uh, one thing we're fairly certain of, and people say, well, what are we going to do about the brass rail? Well, if that's our biggest problem, um, what will be a bigger problem is, is the most junior people, at least in the Senate, get some really crappy offices. <laughs> Over here. So even though the Texas Tribune was already plugged by Brian Roberts, we'll give Ross Ramsey And I didn't say not, anything about him either, so he's I'm, not. I'm not going to plug anything. <laughs> but I got a couple of redistricting questions. One of them is um, if you move the legislative and congressional primaries to May and leave the presidential primary in March, what do you do to turn out and what kind of difference do you get in the people that the primaries elect? Do you get more conservative Republicans? Do you get more liberal Democrats? Is it basically the same people you would have got in March? And the other question is, do we still need the Voting Rights Act? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the answer to the first question is surely there will be a lower turnout in May than there will be for the presidential primary in March. And then the question is, who does show up in, 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 in smaller primaries like that? Uh, we know it's going to be older voters. Uh, we certainly know it's going to be the very most conservative of voters. Um, other than that, that, that's all the answer to that question th th that I really have. There was another question there, the second half. Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Do we Act? we still need a Voting Rights Act? Section 5 is, is being assaulted as, as we speak. What Section 5 does is, one, it requires preclearance. And two, it addresses retrogression, that if you have a, a district, that if you lessen the opportunities of a minority to be represented, uh, have you violated Section 5? I would say that Section 5 is, and this is not the legal argument, and there's some good ones around, it's discriminatory against nine states and some other districts, one of which is in uh, Brooklyn, New York. I think it's discriminatory because um, it, it, it separates them out for transgressions that are long since past us and have been adjudicated. Uh, when we talk about, about Section 2, I think Section 2 ought to be different where we should never be able to discriminate based upon race, color, creed, national origin, uh, physical abilities or different capabilities and, and things like that. Um, should, should we be required to do it? And then we're going to get interpretations because what I will tell you is as years go by, and the majority in this state is Latino, and the majority in the legislature is going to be Latino, and we find a situation where they districted specifically so that an Anglo or an African American could be elected, isn't that discrimination? The question here is, is, is discrimination, and to me it's a very fundamental question. We should not be, we should not have a system that allows any entity or individual to discriminate based upon those criteria. And I don't think going forward, Section 2 necessarily is, is going to ensure that. Last question, JP. Other than that, I have no opinion. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Senator, uh, you talked a little bit about the budget uh, difficulties in last session, uh, especially balancing it. And I know that uh, I think some of the rainy day fund was even allocated for for this that was, it was not used, but allocated to, to balance it. With things like uh, Obamacare coming on, you know, the percentage of Medicaid uh, participants gonna be, is going to be increased pretty exponentially. And I think uh, how, what are the, how difficult do you think it's going to be to provide a balanced budget with, um, with these kind of difficulties, you know, with this lack of money and all these programs? It's going to be extremely difficult. But as an ar overarching philosophy, let me say this. Government should always be short of money. Always. We should always have a tough time balancing the budget because the way we're going to balance the budget is on your back as a taxpayer. If the government has plenty of money, you don't. And I think we ought to be very careful doing that. Obamacare, according to the commissioner of, of the Department of State Health Services, who I think is, is very good, says over the next 10 years it's going to cost us $27 billion additional dollars. I think those numbers are about right. We can't afford that, and I couldn't begin to tell you where that money is going to come from right now. Healthcare is a different is a different set of circumstances because uh, keep in mind that Obama uh, care doesn't deal with health care deals with health care insurance who's going to have it and who's going to pay for it and and so the challenges are going to be profound in in the next few years and I think there was another part to your question um, but it's it's going to be tough, and you've got this very, very strong sentiment that Texans and Americans are already overtaxed, and we must not tax another nickel. And, and therein, we see devices that are sort of odd ones, things like appraisal caps, which means, basically, that you are going to throw out the ad valorem tax system, but what are you going to replace it with? And, and we have to deal with all those questions. It's almost like, in some ways, there are no bad ideas. We need to discuss everything. Um, we have days over in the legislature where there are no good ideas, though. <laughs> That's an even bigger problem. That's, that, can, that can be a big problem. <laughs> well, with that, Senator Kelsolier, thank you very much. Really thank you enjoyed for having it. me.